and gentlemen, we are live once again with the Think Fitness Life podcast, episode 19. Today we're going to talk about goal setting. For those of you who are just tuning in, this is a podcast dedicated to uh, empowering and getting good information out there to everybody with references to mindset and your psychology, how it plays a role into your overall health and wellness, and obviously we, we dive into exercise selection, as well as nutritional and lifestyle choices. My name is Matt Gluckman. I've been a personal trainer for four years, and we have two other trainers with us, Eric Menchi and Michael Urso. Both of them have been training for well over six, seven, eight plus years. Um, they are geniuses. I had the opportunity to work with these guys in person at Equinox in Boston, and I am so honored to be able to chat with them every week and pick their brains and really spread their knowledge uh, across the world because they got some important stuff to say. little announcement for today. Uh, there's a podcast and an individual named Drew Manning. You may have heard of the Fit to Fat to Fit endeavor where a personal trainer gained a bunch of weight and then lost it all again just so he could better relate to his clients. That individual actually works out at my gym here in Salt Lake City, Utah, and he's a great guy really, really intelligent, really informative. Um, and he gets it cause he's, he's experienced it. He has his own podcast called fit to fat to fit. And the most recent episode, um, that I saw in there was episode 149. He got, he interviewed a lady, Kathy Smith, and she's just kind of a, a pioneer in the fitness industry. And she's been around for a while. So she, it's a, it's a really cool and fun podcast to listen to. So check that out. Fit to fat ex- Fit to fat to fit, <laughs> kind of a mouthful. Um, episode one forty nine. Check that out. And today we're going to dive into goal setting today. And uh, yeah, let's start us off. Eric, what you got? Well, Drew Manning is a a classic example of goal setting. What did he do? He gained like forty pounds of fat. I think it was like seventy. Yeah. Just to feel what his clients like, and then he was like, "I'm going to lose it." Like that is the. I think more than forty pounds. That is like, the. It doesn't get more goal setting than that, and I'm glad you kind of brought up that that podcast because he's a prime example of of someone who could have got trapped and been like, I'm going to set a goal and fall off the the ledge and not lose the weight, but he set a goal to gain weight and to prove to people that he can fluctuate and see what it feels like for the normal American person on the diet. So biggest thing for for starting goals is just kind of having that mindset and i know we've talked about mindset before of you know what you're going to do and then how are you going to do it i think that's the first step before even wanting to progress towards a goal is you have to actually mentally think about what it is that you want to do and ponder it and actually decide okay how are you going to do it well let's look back a little bit at kind of how you guys do it um i mean Looking back to maybe the first time you saw yourself consistently working out in the gym, what was your um, overall bigger picture goal? What were you trying to achieve? When I first started, I just had a a long-term goal of gain muscle mass, be as big as I can. And I think – Isn't that still your goal? (laughs) I'm just kidding. Yeah, it is. Um, (laughs) But I think I was looking – more towards the long term rather than short term goals. So I was almost, if I look back, like over trying to overdo it a bit and not looking at what I can accomplish in four weeks, six weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, I was seeing, okay, how can I just jump to week twenty and be there? And I'd look at my program and be like, I can't wait to get here. And I would just there's a lot in between that I would miss out. And I don't think my goal my goals weren't optimized to what I was working at at the time. Right. I think that's how a lot of people start. And um, what about you or so do you have a similar experience when you first started getting to the gym, thinking about what you want to achieve? Kind of. I mean, I, I look at it from a different lens now. I think my, my viewpoint on goals has kind of changed over time, whether it's been talking to clients and their experiences Um, I've done so many different fitness consultations and have talked to people about goals and helped them with goal setting that it's, it's given me a different lens to kind of look through. And I, I think that we tend to look at goals and we objectify kind of 
um, the 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 end point, the, like what we're looking to achieve, with like more of a a tangible type of result a lot of times. But what I find is like as you peel back the layers of like what Eric mentioned, like the why or the motivation be, behind why somebody wants to achieve that specific result, um, you're finding that, and I find that it's more of people are actually looking for a feeling. They're not looking for like, they're not looking for, uh, to, to lose the 10 pounds or to have more energy. They're looking for a specific feeling, meaning like they want to, they, they don't like how they feel and they want to feel a different way. And that's kind of what's driving it a lot of times. And so, um, in the beginning, I think that like a lot of my own personal goals were very metric driven. Like, um, I want to be able to deadlift, you know, let's say three, 300 pounds. So I'm just going to keep scaling up and, and overloading my body progressively until I can, you know, lift that much weight. And that's great. And then once I'm there, I'm like, all right, well, so what's next, you know, now that it's 300, now I got to do 400. And so it's kind of like the whole, that whole theory, like, you know, once you make your first hundred dollars, well then now what, like now I got to make $200. And so it's like, when does it end? But, but like the, the focus then shifts for me. And for when I, when I'm focused on talking with people, it's like, what's the feeling that you want to have? What is the, how do you, how do you want this to feel when you're all, when it's all said and done? Are you looking for more confidence? Are you looking to be um, a little bit more balanced? You know, are you looking like, what, what is the, what is that feeling that you're looking to achieve? And, um, and that's kind of the, the lens that I see it from now versus when I first started out and it being like purely, you know, results and in, in metric driven. And I think that's for a lot of people is yeah. when they start out, it's, it's metric, you know, it's a number on a scale or a number of, of weight. And it's, I think it's a lot deeper than that. And I think that's where people, if they don't see it, that's where all of a sudden their goal setting goes from, Hey, I'm going to do this to It didn't work out. I'm not going to do it. Yeah, and I think one thing that happens a lot, especially in the beginning, is we we think of these goals as like this big like target we want to hit, and we kind of lose sight of you know is the goal realistic? What's my action plan to get there? And quite frankly, in the very beginning when I was getting into the gym and working out more consistently, looking back, my goals were just wishes. I just wanted to get somewhere, and I had this idea in mind of what I wanted to get to, but I didn't really have sort of a, a mapped out idea of how it was going to get there. So like, like, like you guys said, I mean, everything kind of transitioned and, and grew and uh, adapted. And I think kind of the first place I, I started um, was understanding what a SMART goal was, which is SMART just being the acronym for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. And that gave me kind of parameters for, yeah like you guys said, peeling back the layers and, and diving further, like, okay, why do I want this? Why do I want to achieve this? Okay. And then we get to kind of map it out a little bit better and it makes it more, um, it makes it less overwhelming and it makes it m more realistic to, to get, to attain. Yeah, I have. Um, and I think they're really important. I mean, to, to touch all those bases. I, I, I think that you do need some sort of, um, system to follow you know that's essentially what smart goals are they're like they're like guidelines you know they they allow you to to say i'm going to cover all of my bases when i'm approaching uh coming up with you know this concept to to achieve what i want to achieve it, it allows you to break it all down and and touch all the bases but i think um it's so much more complicated can, than that because so, i mean just see, even for you guys personally how many times have you set out on a goal and then that target moves as you're you know you, you set out right. you're like a week or two in right and then all of a sudden that target moves or you decide you know what actually what i was going towards i, I don't want to i don't want to go towards that at all i'm actually looking to try to do this instead and then you know everything changes your whole program has to evolve your habits have to evolve and change and you pivot almost in a way and then maybe some event happens in your life and when you say you know I've, i got eight weeks i want to lose this amount of weight or i want to lift the lift this amount of weight by this eight week period and then all of a sudden you get sick right and then it throws you off course for for a week and then, you know, things change, you're stressed out from work, there's all these different elements, it's really so complicated. And so I think the approach that I found that works with with something like that, like when things get derailed a little bit, 
for me, it's to look at what is the highest aim that I'm looking for. In other words, like what's the, what's that one thing that I'm always going to be striving for? Um, how can I, how can I put that into a sentence? So like, let me, like for me, I'll use an example. I want to, when I'm in my eighties, be a very active individual, meaning like I want to be able to go on a hike. If I want to go on a hike when I'm in my eighties, I want to be able to, you know, go for a jog. I want to be able to run, you know, those are the, those that if I can do that when I'm in my eighties, then that's going to tell me that I've lived a good quality life and that I can, I can always strive for that, you know, that, that ultimate kind of feeling of, of, uh, you know, whatever it is, quality of life. So if that, I need to figure out that first, like how do how do I forecast the future? And then I look at myself and say, well, does everything I'm doing to choosing to do allow me to line up with moving closer to that? Like is, is me striving to, to try to deadlift 500 pounds going to, you know, potentially put me and my goal of being able to be a fully capable human in my eighties at jeopardy because my body can potentially break down because I'm pushing my limits a little bit. So, you know, I think that when you, when you kind of rationalize it that way, um, you know, you can, you can see that, you know, maybe the goals that I'm choosing aren't really aligned with what I ultimately want in life. And I think when we really have to kind of look into that future and say, this is actually what I'm, I'm focused on, or, or this is actually what I want to accomplish. To and I would myself. definitely say a 500 pound deadlift would of course lead to longevity at 80 years old. Right. Am I not right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, maybe, I mean, if you're, if you're in your twenties or thirties, but if you're attempting that in your fifties or sixties and you're, you're sitting at a desk for eight hours a day, well then maybe, you might be jeopardizing your longevity. I mean, this is that whole try. This is that whole pyramids thing where we talk about like we and we've talked about this already. Like, if you're focused on performance, then your longevity will suffer. If you're focused on longevity, then your performance will suffer. So it's kind of a trade off. You know, you have to see like you know which which one am I, I like more invested? We're young. We're young too. I mean, have you had conversations with like a fifty or sixty year old person who's just like starting to work out again? I mean, I'm sure we've trained those people, all of us, at some point. They have a different view, and and you hear those words from them. I, you know, I want to be able to do these everyday life things, and I just feel like I'm not myself anymore. You know. And I, I never really looked at it like that long term of goal. Like for me, long term is the next six months and what I can accomplish and maybe further on obviously longevity, but I'm, I've never really sat down and thought like when I'm this age, I want to be doing this. It kind of definitely gives a little perspective on how I program and what I program. Oh, I know. Yeah. Cause I'm with you. I, yeah. And I'm totally with you. Like I, I don't really like for me, I've done that. I've, I've done some intro, intro, introspection and looked at and said like, this is what I actually want for myself when I'm in my eighties. There's not a lot of people do that, but I think when you get into your 50s, 60s, then that 80 becomes a lot closer than it was when you were in your 30s and 20s. And so now you're thinking a whole different way. You're thinking longevity. You're thinking, wow, like my life is, you know, probably more than halfway over. I've got to really like, you know, step back a little bit and preserve what I have left. And they'll say like, oh, I just, I just don't want to get hurt in the gym, which is totally understandable. Yeah, there's almost two different perspectives. And it's like that 18 to 30 year old who has never experienced any injury and and you might see them performing really heavy exercises with really bad form. And you might even talk to them and try to help them. And it's like, because nothing has hit the fan yet, they don't feel a need to make longevity their goal. And I think for people like ourselves or uh, maybe Maybe a little bit later in your 20s or if you had a, an injury or a traumatic event in your life or you are in that 40, 50 range and you notice your body sort of not performing the way it does, you do start to see that longevity, that bigger picture a lot more than what are you doing this week. And, um, you know, I was definitely in that category too of like in the very, very beginning when I was lifting, I was like, I just want to see what I could do that day, that week. And more and more I got to understand, well, how's this going to play out to – next month? How's this going to make me feel in six months? Um, and get feedback from my body of things like, why am I really tight here? Why am I feeling this pain here? Or why am I super, I have really bad mobility every couple of months? And, um, you know, I think people, again, two categories of like kind of 
you either are really focused on um, kind of that bigger picture mindset and kind of like what you said, Mike, of, of when I'm, when I get to that age, when I get to that 60s, 70s, 80s, I want to be able to perform or, or I want to be able to exercise. I want to be able to be active. I want to be able to, you know, pick up my grandkids. I want to be able to be on the ground playing with them and get up without pain. Um, but that younger class, 18 to 30, I'd say, um, they more so live for the workout of the day or PRs and everything like that, that they lose sight of that longevity aspect. Well, yeah. So the question is, should, should people that young be thinking long-term? I mean, what do you guys think? Like, did you, and, and should. Well, I think it just all depended on the individual, you know, just what is the, what does the person want? What if the, does the person want to be like Jimi Hendrix and uh, Janis Joplin and live fast and die young? Well, if that's what you want, you know, more power to you. I, you know, I want to live a healthy, long life. Um, so just all. Dude, but the question is, do, do people ask themselves deep enough questions to get to that level to, to know that, to even know if they want that or not? I don't think they do either. I, I know from my experience, I certainly wasn't when I was in my 20s. Probably not. Good point. Yeah. Good point. I don't think they do. I don't think they do. No, I, I don't think anyone really is. And I think it's – going back to what Matt said, I think it's a balance. You know, I don't I don't want to condone heavy lifting and be like it's bad for longevity. I think if you can do everything in balance and keep that going, you're fine. But if you look at some of these like bodybuilders from the, the 80s and 90s, I mean look at Ronnie Coleman. The guy can barely walk right now and he hit it hard every day. So that's what you're going to get if you continually put your body through poundings and poundings of workout. I mean he was – phenomenal at what he did he accomplished what he did but his later years of life are not going to be quality just because of what he did so i think it's a balance of between how much can i do can i back off but still get an effect of longevity and then kind of revisit that once in a while yeah there's there's like this um there's this tipping point around the point when people like, so you don't take all of this stuff as seriously. Some do. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not using a blanket term here. I take my health and, and fitness and you guys do as well very seriously. And so do people in our age bracket. But there are a lot of people who get caught up in, they get married, they have kids, they have a very, they're, they're still in that point where they haven't fully developed in their professional careers yet, or they're still kind of moving their way up the corporate ladder. So they're still grinding while they're, you know, trying to take care of kids and pay all their bills and do this thing. And, and then they come to this point where the kids get through school, they get, they graduate college, they're out of the house. And then now they're in their like mid forties to like mid fifties. And now they're like, Oh, well, no, I don't have to take care of the kids anymore. They're on their own. Um, my, my job has finally settled in, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a you know, upper management position. I, I kind of have more flexibility all of a sudden, wow, I better start taking care of myself because look at all the damage I've done and the stress I've endured. And, you know, and there's kind of like this, and, and you guys notice this, like when you're doing consultations that there is this like age range where then it becomes very clear what your goals are when you're in that like 45 to 55 range, you know, it just kind of hits you in the face and you're like, all right, like I got to start taking this seriously because I'm seeing my friends, you know, having these, these health conditions and chronic diseases and diabetes and, you know, my, my friends are on, you know, hypertension medication and on statins. And so I think there becomes this time where, and it's usually around that age range. And I mean, what are your guys thoughts on that? You see the same thing with, with, you know, in your consultations and, in in um, yeah. But I think you make a really good point or so that most people don't know what they truly want. They, they set out for, the gold and they don't understand why they're getting the gold. They don't understand that the gold's going to make them have to get a house and then they're going to want to whatever. Like it's, it's just a stepping stone towards something else and people lose sight of that. And maybe not on, on one end, not ask themselves enough questions about why and dig further, but on the other end, not see the bigger picture and see that once they hit, you know, goal a, what was that leading them to? that should have been leading you to a bigger picture goal. Um, it's, it's, it's basically like a, like a, Oh shit moment that it, I think they realize that they haven't been doing anything or if it affects a family member or a close friend, then they're just like, Hey, I have to do something now. I have to do it fast. I have to do it quick. You know, I have to make up for a lot of lost time. I see that all the time, especially in that age range. 
or especially if people have been doing just the maintenance, you know, oh, I go for runs two, three yeah. times a week. They start realize that's not enough, and they they need to be strength training. They need to, you know, be doing weights, be doing different kind of conditioning. It's very prominent at that age that hey, this is this starts their time to really rope it in and and because what you do between let's say forty and sixty is really going to set you up for what sixty plus. Yeah, yeah, I think part of it is there's just a lot. <laughs> there's a lot in life. There's a lot to do, um, and. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So a lot of people might not pick the choice or option or exercise or food that is going to play them the best, play the best role in overall long-term health uh, until they reach a point where, oh, wow, like this is serious, whether it's they noticed that their someone in their family member had had issues with their health, or they were diagnosed with something, or some you know a loved one was diagnosed with something, and it's it's just something has to be close to home. I feel like for them to really see that they need to do something, and that you know, unfortunately, that in our culture, the way the trends work is that happens at a later age because things are deteriorating and they start to see people around them deteriorating. So yeah, like that probably I said the 18 to 30, you're probably right. Probably close to that 40 is that breaking point of people really making the changes saying, all right, I got to do something about this. Um, But I, I guess I have a question. Why do you think most people would f- fail to reach a goal? Like say, say they, they have their goal in mind. They have that bigger picture, longevity in mind. Um, why would you say maybe the top three reasons that you see with your clients, maybe that people don't achieve their goals or don't hit their goals? I I can answer. Yeah. Complacency. And then another one is two people don't, don't, they, they have a misconception on how motivation works. Um, and this is a concept that I teach in one of my psychology change, um, seminars that I, that I'm putting on for that, this summer series. And um, it's essentially that people think motivation works in a way of they're inspired, they're motivated, and then they take action on it. And it just doesn't work that way because, I mean, we all – well, it's very superficial, but also inspiration means like, you know, essentially you've got a thought of doing something. Something something triggered a thought for you to want to do something. Motivation is where you find your reasons. And then action is obviously the process of doing. So if we were to like look at that process in a real life goal, let's say um, you meet somebody on the street, you haven't seen them in five years, you look at them and you're like, oh, wow, like they've lost a ton of weight. What are you doing? Like, you know, you're very inspired in that moment by them because you think like, wow, like, you know, wow, they could do it. They're my same age. They graduated with me. Like, you know, how come I'm like 20 pounds overweight? And then you have this reason, right? You're, you're motivated from that point on after you're inspired by the person and you're motivated. So your reason is, well, if I lose this weight, when I go to my, you know, my graduation, my 20th graduation, I'll look, you know, more fit. I'll feel better about myself. I'll have more confidence. You have your reason. But the problem is, is motivation is not enough to keep things going. You have to take action. And most people fall kind of flat in that between that motivation and action point, right? Because they just, they're, they're comfortable. And like Eric used a great word, com- they're complacent. Um, but I would just say mot- how motivation actually works is you actually take action first. And the action is what stimulates and produces more inspiration and motivation over time. Um, I'll use this concept. So think about this. D- do you guys jump up when your alarm it's goes off? Do you guys just jump up out of bed and be like, all right, like it, today's a great day. I'm so excited for today. You right? You, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna call bull on both of you if so. Um, nobody really does, right? And why is that? Right? Like first of all, you're not inspired or motivated to get up in the morning. The, the alarm clock is actually action, right? It, it's a trigger that forces you to get up and start moving throughout the day. So the action starts first. Then you start moving and you're like, all right, this isn't so bad. I'm up. Let me just get going. Then your day. Tr- but it's so true. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to create a visual representation of it by the explanation, but. But, but, but yeah, but, but just that's one, one like analogy of, you know, how we have to take action first and then the inspiration and motivation come along the way. And I think that's why people fail is because they don't understand how they, they try to, they try to get things started towards a goal on strictly motivation. 
and it just doesn't work that way. It just motivation doesn't work. You have to take action. Action then spirals into those other things. Uh, yeah, honestly, that that brings me right back. Like the first thing that comes to my head is what we talked about um, programming, and we talked about you made an announcement about a study that showed that people reading all these self help books weren't like they were they were getting worse. It's because they're almost relying on the knowledge or the information or being inspired to to do the work, but right, they they weren't applying anything or they weren't taking action on it. Um, and I remember too, one time you said we had closing statements and you said, if you ever feel stuck, take action, do something physical, get yourself moving and you'll find that motivation, that inspiration afterwards. I think that's a really good point and really fascinating piece to look at because our psychology, we're, we're wired almost to, we have to like seek the knowledge first before we take the action. Like why? Like it, it's it's a trend. Well, let's, and you're never gonna and you're never gonna feel ready to do the the work that's necessary to do the hard to do the hard work that's required to to reach the goal. It's hard work first and foremost. Like this stuff is hard. You're forcing yourself now to do something that you haven't been doing for a long time to set yourself on a new path towards this goal. Right? I mean, just by definition, doing that like you know, reaching a goal is doing something, going somewhere you haven't gone before. So. I mean, you you have to force yourself to do the things, the hard things, the things that you don't want to. So just by do it, programming yourself to take take risks, take challenges, and do those small little tidbits, those can eventually cascade into you know creating bigger you know bigger um you know type of risks or challenges towards something. But I'll say this, like back to what you said, Matt, is like I think like if we look at when we were kids, our parents asked us and forced us to do things we didn't want to do: make your bed, wash the dishes, you know, put your clothes in the hamper you know, take a, take a shower. Like we didn't, you don't, you don't want to do those things. Get out of my liquor cabinet, <laughs> but, but they force you to do those things and then you do them anyway. And then, you know, eventually, Hey, get up and go to practice, you know? Um, but eventually you become a good ball player because you just took action on it. And then you showed up and once you're there, you're like, all right, this wasn't so bad after all. But like, we, we don't, once we become like, you know, full consenting adults and, you know, more autonomous, we don't have anybody telling us, to do the hard things anymore because you know it's 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 easier to not do the hard things and so once we have that control as an adult you know we we kind of lose that edge a little bit or that ability to kind of push ourselves into taking the the hard steps or the action towards something and so we we have to realize that that's that's what's going on here a lot of times in our psychology and we have to force ourselves to do the hard things. If we don't, we're, we're going to be kind of stuck in that kind of six, seven year old mode. And you're just going to be whiny and complaining about everything that's going wrong. And that's your six, seven year old self talking like as a 40, 50 year old adult. I mean, think about how you sound, right? <laughs> yeah. And I think too many people try to empower their children by saying like, well, what do you, like I think of the the big daddy, you know, well, what do you want to wear to school? What do you want to eat for breakfast? Like if you did that, the kid's going to pick all these horrible choices just because he doesn't have the mental capacity to understand what are the right choices for him at that age. Well, parents, parents get a bad rap too, because they're like people like, oh, you know what? They're forcing their kids to play sports that they're probably not interested in. And they want their kid to be like a major league star. And at, I, I mean, really, I'm sorry, but parents aren't really equipped <laughs> to like have a conversation with the kid and say, all right, honey, like sit them down and be like, all right, honey, hey, what, like, what do you want for Get out yourself? of my liquor cabinet. Like, they're kid. Like they really, I don't know about you, but I, I was all over the place when I was a kid. And I think most kids are like, you have, you know, ADD or like, you know, you just, you, there's right. so many different choices of what you could do that you kind of need a parent to just like say, hey, like, you know, just go and do this, you know? And then eventually it, you need direction. Yeah. And, and so many and parents get a bad rap now and people, you know, I feel like there's a lot of like, you know, oh, you shouldn't force your kids to play these sports and things like this that they don't really want to. And I mean, I'm sorry, but like you kind of have to give a nudge and a push sometimes because parents aren't equipped to, they're not therapists where they can sit their kid down and have a conversation, say like, you know, have a goal setting session with them. I'm sorry, but they're just not equipped to do that. So. And that's why, that's why as, as coaches we do, but I think, you know, growing up, like teachers are very important in development and they have to be able to push. It's not just nowadays where maybe like, oh, you know, let the kid do whatever he wants. It's like, no, there has to be structure. 
we're teaching them a lesson. Their brains aren't fully developed to realize, you know, all this in-depth complex learning in mechanism of motivation. But you can apply this to anything like workout, even if, like nowadays, if you let a kid pick what, it, what do you want to do or the eat, they're going to pick, I want to do pizza. I want to play video games and I want to watch TV. And what's that going to set? If you let that happen, but if you let it happen over say five to six years, when that pers- person or kid goes off to college or whatever, like that is all they know. They're not going to have that drive to be like, I need to do this. I need to do that. And I think that's where a lot of the goal setting for not even exercise at the gym, but school studies, um, work, you know, you could do anything from, I, I like how you hit on like the structure of parents. And even you could go as far as school because once we get adults and then we're in the work yeah. workforce, you know, I think workforce so, kind of builds that structure of motivation within your company. Cause you know, if you don't do well, you're going to get fired. But outside of that, there's not much that people have motivation for. Like it's, it's their free will. And that's where you see a lot of their stuff just fall, fall off and they don't care about it, but they do, but they just, they don't have that like action. It's like, ah, I'll get to it another day. There's no. No, there, there's definitely a, a need for um, being the patriarch or the matriarch and, and making decisions and like, like, I don't know. I just love what you're saying. And it's so true Like you, you've got to, check it kind of all out to see what the individual will want or what the child wants to actually do. And, um, actually a couple of weekends ago, um, I was going to, or I went to visit my niece and nephew and, and my brother-in-law and my sister, and they have a pool and my dog hadn't been in the pool. He had been in rivers and lakes and stuff that he can kind of slowly walk into. But this was kind of like, you know, the steps are really steep. So he had to like, just kind of get used to it and get in. And I go to pick him up and people started yelling, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. He doesn't look like he's enjoying that. You're torturing that dog. And I go talk to my brother-in-law and he's just like, you know how I got uh, your niece and nephew to swim? I threw them in. They were so scared. They thought it was horrible. I'm in it at first and they, they didn't want to come in. And then I eventually threw them in and now they're in it. They love it. So he's like, I literally threw my dog in probably four or five times. Then all of a sudden, I'm just sitting there it's w- waiting in the water, like playing around. And all of a sudden, I just hear this big splash. And I look over and he just jumped in. It's because he got used to it. I did have to give him that little push. And you're right. So many people would have said, you know, and they did, of you're, you're torturing that dog or that's horrible or that's inhumane, whatever. But in the end of the day, like sometimes you do have to kind of, Give, uh, I guess the best way to put it is, is a little push, a little little tough love. So yeah, so so the the main the main kind of theory here then is that like we said is that there needs to be some sort of structure. I think we would agree, no matter what level, no matter what level you're at. So I mean, with that being said, what do you guys have in regards to like how you structure the goal setting? Like, is do you have a method? Do you have a uh, is it different for each person? I mean, what do you guys do to go about it? Oh, well, I, my method actually uh, was incorporate or started based upon asking both of you lots of questions. So I'll let you guys answer this because my answer incorp- is involves some of the methods you guys taught me. I mean, one of them was I, sa- I sit down with people and ask them, what do you want to achieve in four weeks? On the smallest level, where do you want to see yourself in four weeks? And that is such a amazing question to stimulate so much thought from somebody. And I got that one from you or so. So I appreciate that. But yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think kind of speaking big picture, um, it's just kind of asking why just always digging further into, well, what do you, what, what are your goals? What are you here for? Why, why'd you come and schedule a sit down assessment with me type of deal? And they give me their goal, right? Well, why, why do you want to make that your goal? Okay. Well, why? Well, why? Well, why? And then you start to see them even kind of looking internally as, well, geez, why do I want that? And that's when you really dig down and peel back the layers, so to speak, and get to that driving motivational force. Um, And you link that goal to them and it just makes it that much more meaningful to them. Um, But yeah, I'll stop kind of speaking in generalizations. Let's hear from you guys. Well, the why is is super important, right? I think there, I forget who said it. There's a quote out there or something along the lines. I'll totally butcher it here. But like if the why is strong enough, then the how, the, the how doesn't matter. Victor, Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. 
It was just like, I think the quote is basically No, it was um it was a psychologist. But yeah, right book. Frederick Nietzsche. Nietzsche, Nietzsche said it, but it's in the book. Oh, it was Nietzsche. Oh, I thought it was fr- – okay, was he qu- – Nietzsche. Nietzsche, yeah, the, Nietzsche. It is Nietzsche, yeah. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, um, basically it was like understanding why you can you can withstand any how. Like if you, if you know why, then you can handle any how. Something along those lines, like the how doesn't matter. So, so yeah. So, I mean, I think that you, and 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 heard a different way. You've heard this: where there's a will, there's a way, right? Is another another way to kind of put it simpler. It's so true, though. Like you have to get very clear on what it is you want to do. What is your motivation? What is your reason behind what you're doing? And and Matt, you said a couple times. I like the term peeling back the layers of the onion. And my daughter all the time is in this. She's a four year old who's asking like 300 questions a day. Like why, why? And I give her an answer, and she's like why? And I find myself having to like chip away the the the, the rock, you know, till I'm like I'm I'm like now I'm like to the core. Of, of the idea and I've like simplified it in a way that is like this is exactly <laughs> like the exact reason of why I you know we started this in the first place so it's it's really like you chip away at it but but it's so important to get that granular about it and um you know I think beyond that too there's there's another Matt you said you know one of the things you say is like I say like what do you want to achieve in four weeks and like starting small well when I do that with people also and I set that monthly intention or that monthly goal I also want to say before they walk out the door because we're talking about action here right action is the thing that moves the needle forward I say what is what is something you can do when you leave today that you can start today that's going to move you closer to that and I want to hear from them what is a habit or a behavior or an action that you're going to take right now because I want them to feel like that process does not start when we start training on Monday. That process starts today. You have control. And I'm trying to show them that they have control when I say that. And and it's so simple. It could be, it could be so easy. I'm going to go home. I'm going to put my workout clothes on my dresser that I'm going to wear tomorrow. That's, and I'm just, I'm not going to put them on. I'm just going to, I'm just going to take that action. I'm going to put them out there, just a small action. And that's really all that matters is like, you're moving that needle forward just a little bit. You know, Eric, what do you, what do you kind of do? Like, or, or what, what kind of structure or process do you have? I definitely have a little bit of a tough love process, like a harsh process. I, I think I kind of like to, even with myself, I like to have people know and that it's not, it's not easy. You know, this isn't something that just a light switch that flicks on and you're like, Hey, I'm motivated. Like it's time to do this. Like, no, absolutely not. Some days I wake up and I'm like, okay, I'm going to, not feeling it, but I drag myself mm-hmm. through, through it. And on sit downs, I kind of, I'll ask people, so let's go on the basis of like a four week goal. And I tell them like, this is going to be tough for four weeks. If you want this in four weeks, you really have to, you know, you're going to miss out on some stuff. You're going to do some stuff you don't like. You're going to have to give up some stuff. And I, for not even lifting, but even for like other goals, say it's studies, school, you know, I want to work hard toward a job. I think I always give the side of like, you know, this is never going to be easy. There's always going to be an obstacle. There's always going to be someone that's going to push you down. And I think I, I dive deep into that with people and kind of make them realize, okay, it's either going to, they're going to say, hmm, I don't want this. It seems too hard. Or they're going to go, I'm going to go around through or over whatever comes. Cause that's my goal. And I kind of like to set a fire under people with that. Just kind of give them that tough love. Just saying this, this isn't all just what it's meant to be in books, magazines, on TV. That's a big eye approach I look. Do you also show do you also show the praise when they break through and they actually like yeah. achieve those different tasks that you like along the way? Oh yeah, cuz I think you have to. If you at certain times, if you don't, then it's just like why am I doing this? What am I doing suffering and he's not even like acknowledging it or they're not even have it. But, but sometimes it'll happen. Sometimes you have to just not say anything because there's sometimes in sports where the coach won't say anything to you and you're expecting this praise. Yeah. Like that reinforcement, right? And more, it's, it, it's more like the hard work, the grind praise than anything else. And I think that's what kind of keeps just keeps people going and like, okay, I'm grinding today. 
tomorrow I can do a little bit more and a little bit more rather than like, Oh, good job. And they're like, that's see, good job. People get complacent and they're like, Oh, I did good today. I can step back. Yeah. Some days you did good. You're going to do good. Other days it's like, no, there's more tomorrow, but that's a big approach I like to take. Um, and I think, I know a lot of people think it's kind of too harsh, but that's just kind of who I am and who is a coach. Yeah. You got to prop problem solve yourself. Yeah. And it, it basically gets back to how bad do you want it and what's your why? I just take a different approach to see how important is this this goal for them, whether short term, long term. You know, if it's that important, then you're going to do it. If it's not, then it's not important. Yeah, that's actually a good quote. It's if it's important to you, you'll find a way. If it's not, you'll find an excuse. And it's kind of a good indicator of when you when you find yourself developing excuses for things then ask yourself is it important for you but i just want to rewind real quick because a good strategy that that works for me personally that i guess i kind of use with with my clients uh anyway is just just time um i was definitely one of those persons that in high school when i wasn't if it was a season i wasn't playing a sport in um i felt like i had more time so i didn't take as much action or I was quicker to procrastinate because, Oh, well, I have plenty of time to do it tomorrow. Uh, but when I was in a sports season and, and had regimented practices and games and tournaments and whatnot, I was just so diligent about everything. So when people will tell me what their goal is and other than that four week goal, um, okay, you want, you want to lose 60 pounds? Like what's, what's our time frame? When do we want to lose this by? When do we realistically want to lose this by? Uh, well, by next year, this time, I'd like to lose 60 pounds. Okay. Well, so then how, how's that going to pace out? We're going to aim for, we're going to shoot for five pounds a month. That's going to make our, our goal there. And that's going to keep our pacing. And I think kind of putting that, that stimulus or that pressure on people is good because I think a lot of people just kind of put things off. Oh yeah, I'll get to the gym next week. I'll get to the gym next week. Or you know, even even people people's micro goals, that four week goal, usually I'll hear, I want to be consistent at, at the gym. So I ask them, how many times a week do you want to get to the gym? How many times a week can you realistically get to the gym? What times can you get to the gym? And I really want them to map out and visualize, kind of like what you said, or so visualize the, them achieving their goal um, and setting themselves up for success. Otherwise, you know, you just say it's just too easy to, to put things off because you just, you have, you think you have so much time. So I do like kind of putting that pressure on them a little bit. It, it is. But then as we're, we're, we're kind of wrapping up here in the next 15 minutes. So I really want to talk about what I feel is probably the most effective strategy that one can use to achieving a goal. And, and for me, like it goes back to what you guys are, I think Eric said it is, which is we control the process, not the outcome. So if we control the process, to me, the most effective strategy that I've ever used and that I've seen the top performers use is called deliberate practice. So essentially deliberate practice means that you're doing something with, you're, you're taking an intent um, in, in, in action with intention every single day. So um, let's think about it this way we, we kind of have to have our outcome first, right? Like you have to define what it is that I want to achieve, the outcome that I'm looking for. But from that outcome, we have to kind of reverse engineer this process. So w once we have our outcome set, then we kind of have to look at what are the skills that we need to develop to achieve that goal. We haven't been able to achieve that goal up until now, so we don't have certain skills that are required to achieve it. What are those skills? I need skills to, to that, that um, potentially can help me achieve that goal. And then once I figure out what those skills are, what is the daily practice or that deliberate practice that I can put into to, to place to help develop those skills? If I practice something daily to develop those skills, I get better at those skills. Those skills will help me achieve the outcome that I'm looking for, right? So think about it in these terms, right? Um, let's use Kobe Bryant. It's one of my favorite basketball players of all time. Uh, I know there may be a lot of Boston people listening here, but I like the Lakers. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, Kobe Bryant, if you, looked, if you looked at this stat, right? He's Kobe Bryant has missed the most shots in NBA history. Okay. That would, will you look at that and you'd be like, you know, that's like, that's a total failure. Um, that being said, Kobe Bryant has five NBA championships. He's the third all time leading scorer in both the regular season and in the playoffs. Right. So, I mean, one of the best of the best in, as far as re, um, achieving the outcome that he set out to do. Now, if you kind of look at what Kobe Bryant does, his outcome every year is to win the championship. 
what what are the skills that he needs to develop in order to win a championship? Well, he needs to be a really good um, defender. He's got to prevent the other team from scoring points, and he has to be a really good scorer. He's got to be able to put up enough points and assist his team in scoring points to over, outscore the other team. Those are really the only things, the only skills that he needs to to have. And there's other ones we can talk about leadership and other other intangibles, but really those are the more tangible skills. So we're talking about tangible skills. And then what does he do every day? Kobe Bryant goes in the gym and he practices his shooting. He he practices longer and harder than most anybody else in the history of, of basketball. And he focuses on conditioning his body so that he can withstand the, the, the endurance that's necessary towards the end of the game. When other teams are fatiguing, he can withstand and, and have more endurance. He practices those skills every day. When he develops those skills, they eventually lead to the outcome he wants. And so this is, this is what top performers are doing at that level. They're, they're just taking this simple philosophy or the simple process and, and really putting it into action. And we can talk about that from a very kind of layman's um, terms of things. So like, for example, I want to be, I want to eat healthier. That's my goal. That's the outcome I want. I want to, I want to be able to eat healthier. So the skill you need to achieve in order to eat healthier is you need to be aware of what you're eating throughout the course of the day. You need to have an awareness, right? That's a, that's a skill from there. How do I develop that skill? Well, I, I put a practice into place every day. I'm going to set a timer, you know, while I'm eating for 20 minutes and make sure that I'm paying attention to how long I'm eating or, you know, just something along the lines of that. But really, if you think about I, that's the only thing I can focus on is the deliberate practice that I'm doing every day that will eventually lead to the outcome that I want. And for me, for my own personal goals and other people, that has been the most successful strategy that I've ever implemented. Yeah, make make sure they go through the process rather than just looking at the, the outcome, because sometimes the outcome of a goal doesn't isn't what someone wants but it's it's learning through the process that's where you can get those small wins and short-term achievements and think yeah but think about it this way and and just the term practice right the term practice is a reframe of the word habit and behavior because think a lot of times you tell people i need to change your habit or you need to change your behavior they, those come with some sort of negative connotations right but when you say practice, practice means practice is something that I'm doing because I want to get better at it. So it's just that simple psycho psychological reframe of the word. Practice means something more positive. It means I'm doing something because I'm doing it to get better. So just that word in itself, that changing of that reframing of the word can lead to a better result. So you're, you're basically changing behavior around, around your goal. And, and I would say I got to get... I got to give credit to Precision Nutrition because that is their coaching model. That is not mine. Uh, they're 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 a hundred percent like credit for that one. They know what they're doing. <laughs> they coach thousands of people a day through their coaching online coaching programs, and uh, they they collect a lot of data. And you know, obviously, it shows that this method works. So, um, I just stole from them. Yeah. Right. And the practice is the action step that we talked about, which is that necessary, it's that necessary component of, of moving the needle forward is just taking the action, taking the action because, you know, you guys have had either yourself or clients where, you know, they've, they're working at um, a goal to lose like 10 pounds for like two months. And, you know, the first four weeks, there's like nothing, nothing changing. But then one day they look in the mirror and they're like, oh, wow. Like I look different or I feel different. And it, it almost like comes in an instant, but we know it didn't happen in an instant. It was a comp, it was like compounding interest over time that just immediately kind of hit you. And you're like, wow, like <laughs> I'm rich bitch. <laughs> right. So you're, you're basically changing behavior right. around, around your goal. And I think it's great how all like goal setting is great, but you can't just have goal setting without practicing a skill. And you got to hone those skills, no matter what it is, whatever your skill is, you hone it. And then it's a big component of your why and your goal and what you want to achieve. It's not just. Yeah. Well, those are Eric, those are self-fulfilling prophecies too, because if we don't take action, like say we think of something, we think like, oh, I should go do that. But then you don't go take action on it. All you're doing is reinforcing and conditioning, um, 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Procrastination. All you're doing is conditioning more procrastination the more you do that. So the more that you condition yourself to have the thought, oh, I should go do that, and then you take some sort of action towards it, you immediately condition yourself to be a non-procrastinator. You know, somebody who just who just takes action on things, and eventually that becomes your new default. Whereas the opposite happens if you think about things and you keep putting them off or you you don't move like some sort of, and this is why, Matt, we talked about this in the beginning, that physical, it's that physical engagement in something. It's when you're in a funk, right? We've said this so many times. It's like do something physical because it's the physical movement towards something that actually creates that kind of response within our, within our physiology that, you know, moves us closer to it. So that's really like what the key is, is like when you, even if it's like, even if it's like grabbing a pen and having a thought and I'm just going to write it down, like I'm not even going to do it. I'm just going to write it down. It's just the action of moving closer to it by writing it down that actually creates that positive feedback. I think it helps a lot. It's just, it's just parts to a whole. And once you get to that whole, that might be a short, short term, it's more parts to even a bigger whole. Yeah. I mean, we, if you understand your psychology and how it works, you can understand how to hack it. Um, so many people think, you know, that, you know, I'll just, when I find the motivation, I'll, I'll, I'll end up, you know, doing it or I'll end up, I'll end up getting started. It just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, no. And it's, it goes back to the alarm clock. If you didn't rely on the action of the alarm clock to wake you up, your, your day would be a disaster. It'd be a disaster. So each day we practice action. I don't, and I think it's to the point where we're, we're done as coaches and people, you know, talking, you know, you hear a lot of people talk, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Stop talking. Just go practice that action. Just do it. And I think that's where a lot of people need to just stop going even back to the self self help books that you read. Stop just thinking about it and actually practice rather than reading 10 books, put the book down and go do something you learn in the book and do it till you reach your goal, then pick up another book. Yeah, I think it's also important to mention that taking action doesn't necessarily mean you have to, you know, if you're trying to eat healthier and lose weight, taking action doesn't necessarily mean you have to run out right now and go for a, a run until you're about to pass out and die. But um, even taking action of just, I mean, obviously you need to go exercise, but even taking action of just going through your cabinet and seeing what you shouldn't be eating when, when you're in that right state of mind when you know that you should shouldn't have your goals are to lose weight your goals to eat healthier per like clean out your closet set up your environment a little bit better make a list of uh, a grocery list for yourself maybe try out a blue apron or one of these meal prep services taking action just like that rather than conceptualizing your goal or thinking about it so much is going to be taking the steps towards your goal and then you're going to gain momentum because you're going to gain more motivation as you start to achieve some of this stuff brain physiology right there i mean it doesn't get better than that it's all conditions so alarm clock goes off in the morning people should get up and shoot out of bed that will start the day with mentally conditioning your brain to not procrastinate that's the biggest test of the day that is the uh, Eric. That is probably the best words I've ever heard come out of your mouth. That is literally that. That is literally one of the best strategies you could do. If you were gonna, if I was to tell people listening to this, if there's something you can do, like today or sorry, tomorrow morning to start moving the needle forward on taking action, do exactly what he just said. Jump out of bed when the alarm clock goes off, hundred percent. And I didn't not my words, but I got it from someone else. No, oh, it's so true because it's, it's a learned behavior to snooze or procrastinate and you just get better and better at that part. And sorry, I'm, I'm still here, just in the background. I'm, I'm signing us up for an Ironman in 2060 when we're all past our 50s. I think that's a, our longevity goal. We just got to take action. We just got to set the date. <laughs> um, it'll be a little unfair because... Urso will be a little bit older than us, but I'd, I'd be down. He'll be lapping us while he's doing like relaxing breathing or something. <laughs> oh, baby, baby, I'll be right there. I'll be, I'll be lapping you. <laughs> Age ain't but a number. <laughs> <laughs>
No, I believe it. I believe it. I think we could all do an Iron Man at sixty. I think if we if our longevity goals are all aligned and none of us get hit by a car, we could we could do it by sixty. That means I have to stop deadlifting heavy, though. I don't know. <laughs> no, you 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 got good good form, and you're not putting too much tension on your lower back with a trap bar. You'd be fine. Well, let's. Um, I think we we kind of covered all of our bases here. We talked a lot about strategies, about different reasons why people don't hit their goals, and different psychological hacks to getting your goals um, action oriented and actually setting realistic goals for yourself that you can hit. And let's uh, let's start off with closing statements. Eric, what you got? Man, I think I already th- threw mine out with the alarm clock, but I got to come up with another one. Set a goal. Make it, whether it's long-term, short-term, short term, and like Mike said, practice towards that goal. It's a constant battle, day in, day out. Everything is a test throughout the day, whether it's not doing it, sleeping in, or getting up and attacking what you want. Always be on the attack. Always be on that grind. It's going to suck at times. It's going to be awful. You're going to want to quit. You're going to want to not work towards your goal, but don't. Don't bend to that complacency. You have to be stronger than that. Mentally, it's all going to stem from what you do and what you practice. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of piggyback on the, on the end of that one. Just um, it, it is important to think, but don't overthink. Just take action, practice, learn as you go. Don't let fear prevent you from actually trying or practicing. Yeah. And for me, like while, while I'm a firm believer and I'm preaching, you know, taking action and how important it is, but I also think that one thing that we we should not overlook, and I certainly don't overlook is a lot of people are looking for their motivation to come from outside of them, right? They're looking for, they're looking for something to just that light bulb moment or that aha moment, like, all right, now I'm ready. Or like now all the stars have aligned so I can move forward, you know, going to the gym or starting to eat healthy. Um, we're all just one decision away from turning it around. Like what you're literally one decision away from turning wherever you are around. And I think that what we do is we look, it's never too late. Yeah. You know, we talked about like the, the Chinese proverb, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now it's today. Like you, you, you don't have you, like, why are you waiting? Like the time has already gone by. It's not, you're not getting any younger. Um, and you can hear that you'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But really it's true. It's really true. Like if you keep putting it off, you're just going to continue reinforcing procrastination. So start taking action. But, but to the point I wanted to say was we have to be able to not just wait for things to come to us or come from outside of us. Not, not enough of us when we're setting a goal or we're, or we're trying to, um, you know, break down, how do we, how do we go about even starting? Well, you got to go inside. You got to look inside. And this goes back to that. Why? You have to write down, like ask yourself questions. Don't wait for somebody else to ask you questions. The, the best answers and the solutions are all in questions. They all come from questions. So write down questions for yourself. Why do I want this? What is this going to do for me? When I achieve this, how is this going to make me feel? Write down your answers to these questions and they become real. Like you get it out there and now you've taken what was inside and you've put it out and now you can look at it and you can see it all there from that 30,000 foot view. And when you have that type of information, what we talk about like knowledge is power. Knowledge is not power. Knowledge is potential power and knowledge only becomes power for you when you start to take action on it. So it's not good enough to just know what to do. You actually have to write it down and take action on it. So that's basically what I would say is get go inside figure out what it is for you and write it down and and look at it and read it and stare it in the face and see if it does not you know challenge you and move uh, move you to start taking action all right well that wraps us up today for goal setting next week we're going to dive into fasting i'm excited about that podcast but hope you guys enjoyed stay tuned peace